account automation. In this nugget, we're going to be talking about account automation. We're going to be working a lot with accounts as domain administrators or as any kind of an IT professional. So we want to make this as quick and easy as we possibly can rather than just having to do everything manually. Now, sometimes you'll still have to do things manually, but otherwise you'll have some automated methods here that you can use. First thing we'll talk about here will be templates, which is actually a manually created account, but that you can use to as the basis for other accounts, which will already have you know kind of pre-configured data in it. We we'll also talk about LDIF DE, which Microsoft seemed to be really excited about, but they were kind of the only ones because nobody seemed to like it that much. But we still need to know about it and how the basics of it work, as well as CSV DE, kind of some two similar kinds of tools that do a similar kind of a function but we'll probably park on DS Add and spend a little bit more time with that because it gives us a great deal of flexibility and capability in creating directory services objects. Now these are not actually object, or rather uh, tools that we can use to automatically create accounts, but they can automatically modify, move, you know, uh, otherwise manipulate accounts. So we'll take a look at DS Mod to modify, DS Query to query against accounts, DS Get to get information against queried accounts, DS Move, which obviously just moves an account, and DSRM, which would remove accounts. And then in our next video, I just want to make sure that you're aware of this, in our next video, we're going to talk about PowerShell and VB Script. I wanted to cover it at the end of this one, but I think it would make it much too long, so we'll talk about that in our next nugget. Hey, did you ever wish that people didn't really exist? <laughs> I mean, wouldn't that be nice sometimes? I mean, after all, that way you could never embarrass yourself in front of them or commit a faux pas or something like that. I know I certainly felt that way myself recently because, you see, my wife is a public speaker, and she speaks to hundreds of people sometimes in a given meeting. And she talks about very important life issues and things, and a lot of times at the end of these meetings, you know, there are people with tears in their eyes and things like this, and it's a very somber meeting sometimes quite at, at the end. It's kind of like, you know, the last day of summer camp or something like that. But anyway, uh, this happened recently, and uh, I was at the back of the room. I like to go and support my wife in her speaking engagements and things. So I was in the very back of the room supporting her there and listening to her. And uh, it was one of those somber moments where you could have heard a pin drop. And a lot of people were very serious and had, had taken to heart some of the things that she said. Well, at that moment, I felt a sneeze coming on. Here's the thing about my sneezes, folks. Uh, if I were to sneeze right now, I'd have to pause recording first because it would blow your ears out. I mean, I'm, I'm afraid that I've always sneezed loud. I've never been one of those people that can sneeze like a little kitten or something like that. Well, I felt a sneeze coming on at the very most important moment of my wife's meeting while I was at the back of the room. And I, I realized that I couldn't make it to the back door and out of the room in time to do this sneeze. So I thought, what in the world am I going to do? Well, I had a, I decided, you know, maybe I'll just sneeze into my massive bicep. You know, so I lifted my, my arm up and I put my, you know, my bicep by my, my nose and mouth. And I decided to sneeze right there. And I thought maybe that would muffle it. Well, as it happens, I was wearing a kind of a short-sleeved Under Armour shirt. So when I did that, my mouth went right on bare skin. And instead of sneezing like that, it wound up making a huge farting sound, people. <laughs> And to make matters worse, you could hear both the sneeze and the fart, so it made it sound as if I sneezed and was not able to hold myself together. And yes, it was all quite loud. And there were a couple of hundred people in the room, and so I, had, I saw several people in front of me, because I was in the back of the room, several people in front of me turn around and kind of give me glares over what they perceived to have happened. <laughs> well, fortunately, when it comes to user accounts, yes, those are not real people. Yeah, I mean, sure, I'm sure they're real people somewhere, but we don't usually have to deal with them or even uh, commit any faux pas in front of them. For us, they're just electronic things on the computer. Hey, we could even delete those people if we want to, right? So when we talk about accounts now in Active Directory, we can create hundreds of these people, all of which may never cause us a problem or an embarrassment. Now let's go ahead and take a look at how we can create these accounts and moreover, how we can do this in an automatic fashion. So as far as account automation is concerned, we have a number of different methods that we can use to make this more automatic or at least semi-automatic. A lot of this will require set up in advance in order for us to be able to do this. One of the things we can use is templates. Now, in order to show you the strength of templates, I first have to show you how we create accounts normally. And you may have seen me do this in the past, but I'm just going to quickly go through here and uh, create a user account just real quick by right-clicking and choosing New User. By the way, if you look here, you notice that I've deleted any other user accounts we've created, any other OUs and so forth. I'm just kind of starting from scratch here. And let's just say I've got a user here called, you know, Jessica... I don't know, <laughs> uh, Sanders, 
Okay, almost said Simpson. Wouldn't that be nice? But anyway, Jessica Sanders. Something like this. And we just kind of next, next, finish through the wizard. And we just fill it all in. And we have to decide, you know, whether we want to do any of these different things or anything. Right now, I'm just going to leave them at the default. And then I kind of just next and finish. And that's pretty much it. But notice that we didn't really have a lot of things there that we might need to fill out. Such as, what if I want to configure something about you know, what the user's logon hours are. Uh, or if I want to configure their group membership. Well, there's no way to do that when you actually create the account. And the reason why is because you can't populate those Active Directory attributes until the object actually exists. This Jessica Sanders account did not exist until I clicked on Finish. And so that's why we don't see, as I double click it now, we don't see all these other tabs and all these other options and things that we can fill in after the fact, like we do here. So let's say that I want to also make this person a member of some accounts, and uh, maybe I want to go make sure that she's a member of a certain department. You know, let's just call her the HR department, for example. And since she's in the HR department, I need to make her a member of the HR users security group. I think I have one here that I created in advance. So there it is. And let's say that this person is also a member of uh, clerical staff. You know, so there's the clerical staff. And then I, you know, I could do a number of other things in this. You know, I could enter in some information about their account, you know, all these different options down through here, and so forth. So there's a lot of different things that I could do, but I'm just going to click OK for now just to demonstrate that, you know, if we had to create an account one at a time, that's pretty much how you'd have to do it. Now, here's the thing. If I have a whole new department that we've hired, and I've got to do that kind of account creation times dozens of times or even hundreds of times, this may also be the case in the, in the event of a company merger, for example, or we're bringing all kinds of new employees in, or in an envir educational environment, where at the start of the semester, maybe we've got hundreds or thousands of new uh, new pupils, bright-eyed pupils coming in that really want to learn. Okay, well, I've got to create an account for these people, and that's going to have to be more automatic than what I just did. So what I might do here, instead of creating accounts uh, individually like Jessica Sanders, which I just deleted offline, by the way, uh, is to do use another method. And this is somewhat, you know, kind of semi-automated, if you will. Again, I'll right-click to create a new user, and I'll make this one a template account. I, you don't have to do this, but what I normally do is I create template accounts with an underscore at the beginning. And the reason for that is because they will then float to the top of the list of accounts you can see here in the background uh, when I'm done with it. So I'm going to make this my HR, you know, clerical staff uh, template account. That way, anytime someone comes into my clerical staff in the HR department, I'll use this template to automatically configure things for them. So let's make this, uh, again, you know, underscore HR clerical staff. And then next. And then I'll go ahead and uh, say, you know, the account is disabled because this is not an account that we actually use. This is only used for, uh, and we don't actually use it for logging on. We only use it to create other accounts, okay? So here's my cl HR clerical staff. Now, when my Jessica Sanders user comes in, then I want to just go ahead and copy this account. First of all, though, let me go ahead and further populate it with some other things that we'd already talked about. I want to make this person a member of uh, you know, HR users and uh, clerical staff. Okay, so we have that. Maybe we also want to you know, go to their account properties. Maybe the clerical staff is only supposed to work during certain periods of the day. So I'm going to deny their access to you know, any logon period, but they're only supposed to be able to work at the earliest from 6 a.m. on Monday through, say, 6 p.m. on Friday. And so I think I got that all spaced out right. So it'd be like this, okay? So then I'd click OK, and now those are the only hours that anybody can work there. Uh, other things we could do is to fill in virtually any of the rest of these things, but I'll just go ahead and also go here to the department, you know, for HR, make that person a HR department member. Now, once again, this is not a real user. The, the effectiveness of this template account will come when I want to create an individual user account, but I don't want to duplicate all that work that I just did. So with this template account, I get a new user that's a member of the HR clerical staff. I'll right-click here and choose Copy, and I'll just say this is a, you know, the same user. I just want to create it in, a, in an easier way. You know, Jessica and Sanders... Uh, and then this account I'm not going to disable uh, because I know this is a real user that will want to log on. Now I'll just go ahead and click on Next and Finish. And now I've got that user created, but notice that if I go to you know Organization, I didn't have to fill this in. If I go to something like 
oh, where was it? The account item and the logon hours. I didn't have to fill that in. That was already automatically done. Why? Because all of this stuff was copied from my template account. And you can see here, of course, that my member of and the, the, the group memberships that he or she is a member of also are already there. So I don't have to do all of that as a separate step. And I've kind of semi-automated the creation of a user account. Once again, this is called using a template. And you create kind of a dummy account, which is normally going to be disabled. And uh, then you just copy it by right-clicking on it and choosing Copy. Now, there are some other things that I can do that will somewhat be more automatic, like the ldiff de command, which is very similar to the csvde command. These are commands that we've been able to use ever since Windows 2000, uh, and we'll go ahead and take a look here at how these work. Now, first of all, let's go ahead and take a look at some files that I've created that I'll make available for you. And let me go here to... Uh, where do I have them? Uh, student Files Accounts. Most or all of this will be available to you, and I'm going to make these available up on NuggetLab.com. Uh, these are going to be kind of template files, if you will, or example files that might help your own usefulness for these tools to be easier, give you a little bit of a head start. And you can use these as they are, and then just, of course, replace any values that name you know, NuggetLab.com with your own domain or with your own organizational units and so forth. And to start with, let's go ahead and take a look at this LDF required file. And this is actually a batch file. Let me do this. Let me go to Tools, Folder Options, and View. And then here I'm going to make the file extensions visible. Uh, and I'm actually I'm going to change a few different things. And I think you're probably familiar with these. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and select all these items, particularly this Hide Extensions for Known File Types. I'm going to remove that checkbox so that we can see that indeed this is a batch file. Now let's go ahead and right click on this to choose edit and we'll see the kind of syntax that we might need to use for this particular command. Now first of all, this batch file will not create any user accounts. Okay, that's not the purpose of this. Both ldiffde and another command that I'll show you in a little while called csvde, by their default behavior, they actually export existing accounts. The reason why I would want to do that in this case is because I want to export this to a file that will make it easier for me to be able to work with later on. So, for example, what this command will do is going to export to a file, and by, that's the default behavior is to export, and then it's going to be the file is going to be c colon backslash export user.ldf. Actually, let me do this. I want to put it in scripts. I have a directory that I've created called scripts. Uh, so it'll put it in this file, which could be useful later on to be able to then modify that and then use the same file to import users somewhere else if I want. Uh, the server that I want to work with is DC Nugget one I don't have to put this dash s and then the name of the server since I'm running it locally on the server, but uh, I can, I'm just doing it here for measure so that you see that that option is available. And then you can also enter in permissions if you need to. Then, I don't know why it has a dash p. I thought it would be some other, you know, some other letter. I guess I can't use S because it's already been used, but this stands for the scope. And the scope that I want to look for is the entire subtree of the entire domain. And then what I want to do is to use the dash R to filter. And what this is saying is I want to export certain accounts that have the following characteristics. And let's go ahead and take a look at those. Uh, the, and this is just kind of the weird syntax. It starts with a quote and then a parens and then an ampersand. Uh, you just got to put that in. I mean, you, you don't really have much choice there. And then a parens here. And then the object category I'm looking for is persons. The object class is going to be a user object class. These are all Active Directory types of items here. And then a given name. We usually would say first name. But in Active Directory attributes, this is called a given name. And I'm going to leave an asterisk in there. That just means anybody that has the field filled in for given name. Okay. And then what we have here is a dash L. This is going to list uh, the attributes in the LDAP search. So it's going to list these different things. Okay, And those are the things that I want to appear. The common name, the given name, the object class, same account name, and password. Okay, And then we'll just pause. Uh, and the reason for pausing is really not a productive reason. It's because I want to see if there are any error messages. If I run this whole thing and I don't have the pause in there and there was an error message, it just flashes on the screen real quick and it's really hard to identify what went wrong. So I'm going to go ahead and close that out and I'm going to go ahead and save it because remember I did save the uh, change the file or the uh, location of that file where it's going to go. And then I'm going to go ahead and run this. 
And then here I've kind of skipped ahead to the scripts directory where I've got the export user.ldf file. And as I double click on that, you can see that indeed it takes up the distinguished name, that's DN, distinguished name of the account. And it has, you know, the Active Directory attributes that we're looking for, like the given name is one of the things that we specified and so forth. And then what I could do with this is to use this as kind of a template idea to be able to modify this for my own purposes to use it later on to import accounts as well. And I'm going to go ahead and use a similar thing to that here in just a moment. What I'm going to do is to go to a my scripts right here, and I've got uh, one right here somewhere. Uh, yes, it's going to be this new user onelf and I have set the file association of LDF files to open up in Notepad, and you can see this looks very similar to what I just showed you here. Uh, if, I'm only going to create a single user account here, but if I had multiple accounts, then I would just put, enter in a, uh, a space, and then distinguish name, and then enter in all of the rest of the stuff here, except for, you know, of course, different names and so forth. Uh, but that's how you would do this. Any additional accounts you, cre you create would be sp separated by an additional space. Now, what's this going to give me? It's going to give me the distinguished name of a user named Sal. Uh, I'm going to put them into the container of the user's container. That's a user object class with the name of Sal. And it's going to give the user account control of 514. Now, the user account control is not the same thing that we're accustomed to on Vista in 2008 as user account control. That's where we normally see the prompt for administrative access. In this case, what that's really talking about is whether or not the account is enabled or disabled. Now, with, with LDIFDE and CSVDE, you can never use those to create accounts and the passwords that go with those accounts. So therefore, all accounts will be disabled as soon as they're created. So I don't really have to put this in here because 514 means disabled, but I just put it in there for measure. If you wanted to specifically enable something, you'd put in a 512. Uh, but we'll have to put in 514 uh, in this case. And again, it will be disabled anyway because there's no password. And then I have a user principal name here. So that gives me an idea of what's going on here with this. So I'm going to choose don't save with that. And then from a command line, I'm going to point to it. So here I'm going to go to an administrator command prompt and run ldefde-i, meaning to import what the contents of an account file are. And then the file itself, the dash f, is in the v colon backslash student files accounts new user one dot ldf. And then a dash j colon and then c colon backslash scripts. This j means that I'm going to tell it to create a log file in case anything goes wrong. I wish they'd use an L for log file, but hey, they use J instead. So anyway, we'll go ahead and run this, and then we'll see that the command completed successfully, and one entry was modified successfully, which is a little bit of a misnomer because it wasn't modified, it was you know, created. So then I'm going to go back into here, and I'm going to look for my Sal account. And I don't see it. And why is that? Because remember, this is the MMC console, which means it needs frequent refreshing. So I need to select the user's container, refresh the screen. Now I see my disabled Sal account. Notice the little, I don't know if you can see that, but there's a little black down arrow there. That means disabled in our current environment. And I'll double click on this, and sure enough, there's the Sal account. Now, notice how blank most of the rest of this stuff is. Uh, once again, you know, I could fill in most or all of these Active Directory attributes using that same utility and same command that I just had. It's just that I only chose kind of some bare essentials such as these items right here. Okay. All right, so that's how we work with that account. Now, you might look at that and you might say to yourself, James, this is not easy. You mean if I want to automate, quote unquote, the creation of all of these things, I have to type in this, and then I have to type in this, and then I have to type in this. For crying out loud, it's easier just to do it through a right click and then a next, next, finish in the wizard than to type all of this information in. And I barely have any, this is just the bare essentials. Most of the time, we're going to want more information than just this. Well, that's exactly one reason why LDIF did not really catch on very well. <laughs> because you do have to jump through some hoops to so-called get it automated for whatever level of automation that is. The real thing, the real strength with LDIF DE comes in if you're also adept at databases or spreadsheets, because you can use something like, you know, even something simple like, you know, Access or an Excel spreadsheet to be able to export data out of those tools, out of those programs, into a plain text file that you can use with LDIF DE. So it takes a little bit of front end work, but, you know, eventually if you're willing to put the work into it and you have to work with a great many accounts, it might be worth your while. Other possibility that you could work with there is when maybe Human Resources hires new employees. They might be able to enter the, the data for those new employees into a certain kind of database, and then you might have read access to certain parts of that database to be able to automatically pre-populate various items 
in uh, an LDIF DE file uh, like I've got here. Maybe we're able to cobble that together. That's just a creative idea. You don't have to know about exactly how to do that for the exam purposes. And in fact, you know, for, for LDIF DE and CSV DE, you don't need to know every detail about it other than to be aware of the fact that you can import user accounts using these tools. And as you saw me do from the command line here, remember, both these tools uh, are going to be a uh, an export tool by default unless you also specify the dash i and then it's going to import whatever file you specify there. Uh, now I've also created an LDIF versus CSVDE file here. This is a PDF file that's going to be available for you on Nugget Lab. It's kind of small here. Let me see if I can uh, increase the size of this just a bit. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and see that you, you have a number of different other things that you can work with here. And I've given you some LDIF DE examples and an export example and an import example. We're going to go, go ahead and come back to that. But let's talk about what LDIF DE is for us here, first of all. It's going to be the draft internet standard for LDAP systems. You see, Microsoft did not invent LDAP database. LDAP is Lightweight Directory Access Protocol, which Active Directory is based on. There are other directory services out there that can also use LDIF DE. I could import or create a user account or export a user account from some other LDAP system out there. It's also a block-based format that goes to the kind of format that I was showing you about here when I work with this. So, for example, if I had my... Uh, uh, where to go? Uh, if I had my file, which let me go back to that here, then remember that this is going to be in kind of block format. Like there's one account, then there's another account. Uh, this was an export, but I could use something like this to import it. And again, it's going to be separated by a space in between. So it's kind of a block-based format instead of everything appearing on a single line. It's also multiple operations are going to be separated by that blank line that I just specified. And you can modify or move existing objects with LDIF DE. Okay, so just keep those things in mind, and we'll be coming back to that here shortly. Or actually, I guess we're done with uh, LDIF DE. But now let's move on to CSV DE. Now for this, I'm going to go to my CSV users.bat file, which again will be available for you also up on nuggetlab.com. And as we look at this item, we'll see that we have CSV DE dash F. This is going to be an export because I didn't specify a dash I. And it's going to export into a file called CSV user.csv in the scripts directory. Uh, here is the scope of the operation. That's going to be the subtree of the entire domain. And then again, this is going to be the types of objects that I'm looking for. And it's going to be a person, the class user. This is the same kind of syntax, by the way, that we had with LDIF DE. So this is nothing new right here. And then <clears throat> we have the common name, the given name, the object class, and the same account name that we also want to see there. And I'm just going to go ahead and quickly run this one as well. Once again, it's going to be very similar to what we saw earlier. And again, I put a pause statement in there so that I could pick out any error messages that might have appeared. Now as I go here, I see that it has created a spreadsheet file, or rather a CSV file for me. This is a comma separated value file. And I'm just going to expand all the columns here so that we can make this a little bit easier to read. Notice that at the top line here, it creates headers of distinguished name, object class, common name, given name, same account name, and any other active directory attributes that I would want to specify. Again, I only kind of included the bare minimum there in my batch file, but you can certainly add additional things in there. Uh, and then we have the distinguished name the itself that appears here. This is the actual data that appears under the heading. Uh, then what we can do here is we can take this same kind of information and uh, use this kind of as a template, if you will. So maybe I don't really want all of this information. For example, let's just tr try it this way. Let me go ahead and delete this. And I'm going to go ahead and take Jessica Sanders here. I'm going to drag this person up here to the top. And I'm going to go ahead and save this file. I'm going to go ahead and, since it's a CSV format, um, I'm going to save it without using additional features that Excel does offer. It's just a plain format, and I'm going to say yes to save it in that format. Now, oddly, even though I just saved it with the CSV format, it, it also asked me if I want to save it again. Okay, fine. Yeah, I'll save it. Yes, yes. How many times do I have to tell you? So anyway, I saved it again here, and, and there it is. Now, the next thing I might want to do is to import that. But first, to emphasize that this would work, let me delete my Jessica Sanders account. Okay, so I delete this user account. And then I'm going to go ahead and create the account using CSVDE. So now then having deleted that Jessica Sanders account, I've gone back here to my command prompt, and I'm running CSVDE to import this particular file, CSV user.csv, 
which has only that one user account. And now we'll see what happens. We go back to Server Manager. Again, we'll have to refresh the screen here. But as I refresh the screen, there's my Jessica Sanders account. Remember, it's disabled because I can't put a password in. And then that's pretty much it. Now, this, of course, again, is just the bare, bare essentials. Uh, but it gives you at least the, um, the minimum that you would have to have to be able to work with this. So notice that, again, uh, we don't have much here. So that's pretty much it for how you work with CSVDE and LDIFDE. Let's take a look at more details on CSVDE now. Uh, first of all, this is going to be something that uses a comma delimited text file. You can either export to or import from a CSV. This is the, f the first line is going to define the attributes of the spreadsheet file. So remember when we looked at that, the first line here defined the attributes that I wanted to work with there. The distinguished name, the object class, and so forth. The data lines have to have corresponding attributes. So each one of these data line each one of these data lines down here has to have a corresponding attribute. So let's just go ahead and I'll expand this out again. I can't I have a distinguished name a uh, heading and a distinguished name, an object class and the type of object class, a common name and the common name. I can't have a given name and then nothing here. Okay, so you have to have a corresponding entry for each one of those items. And that's important to know about there as well. Uh, you cannot modify or move existing objects, whereas with LDIFDE, you can modify or move existing objects. But I think that you're going to like some other tools much better, such as DSMod or DSMove, that we'll look at a little bit later on. Now, both of these tools do have something in common. You can import and export Active Directory objects, with export being the default, and you import with a dash I. That would be something that I would suspect might be an important exam item. You cannot import a user password, as I mentioned earlier. Therefore, all the accounts are going to be disabled by default. And then I also have for you here CSVDE import and CSVDE export examples here as well. So I've got some examples there for you in the, the PDF file that's available for you up on NuggetLab.com. So that was, again, LDFDE and CSVDE. Now let's move on to DSAD. Now DSAD is the primary tool that we can use to be able to add new accounts. I actually like DSAD quite a lot better than LDFDE or CSVDE. DSAD could potentially also require a great deal of typing. However, it's much easier to use a spreadsheet in conjunction with DSAD, in my opinion, uh, than LDFDE for sure, and possibly also CSVDE. So with DSAD, how can I make that work? Well, first of all, let me let me just show you some examples. Let me clear the screen there. Uh, if I were to go ahead and type dsad ou and then ou equals bisbee in the domain component of Nugget Lab, the domain component of .com. Uh, I can't remember if I've mentioned this to you or not before, so let's just review this really quickly. Uh, this is the distinguished name, and an organizational unit would be ou, and then my, the name of my ou would be bisbee. dc is the domain component. That's the first part of the domain, which would be Nugget Lab, and then the .com would be the other part of the domain, of course. You may also see cn, which would be common common names, and that's how you would create user accounts and groups, for example. But here I'm just going to go ahead and run this, and uh, we'll see what happens with it. First of all, notice that if I refresh the screen here, there is no Bisbee or anything like that in here. So I, this should create a Bisbee organizational unit here for me. And if I refresh the screen, sure enough, now I've got Bisbee there. So qu quick and easy, that's how that's done. Now then I also might want to create a security group. So here I'm just going to go DSAD group, and it's going to be a group called the Bisbee users here. And then it's going to be in the OU that I just created in NuggetLab.com. And I'll press Enter. And now we'll see that if I refresh the screen, once again, now we see the Bisbee users security group. Notice that if you don't specify anything about what kind of a group it is, it's going to be a global security group. Okay, so that's the kind of group that we've got. Next, I might want to go ahead and add a user account. So I'll go here and choose DSAD user. Again, the common name is going to be bisbeeuser01 in this case. Uh, and of course, you can add a lot of different things in here. For example, I have done nothing to enter in a password. With DSAD, by the way, you can enter in the password either as an asterisk, which would then prompt you to manually type it in, or you can actually uh, type it in itself right here, just that it would be susceptible to someone you know, shoulder surfing and watching over your shoulder and seeing you type in a potentially confidential password. So anyway, I'm just going to go ahead and enter in this account. It's going to have to be a disabled account because, of course, there's no uh, password on it. But there it is. Okay, so real easy way to create user accounts as well. 
Now, as you're looking at this, you're saying, okay, James, there's not a whole lot of automation yet because uh, I see that you've been able to type real fast somehow and put all that in there, but maybe it would take you longer. <laughs> well, I kind of cheated because what I did was I created my own little cheat sheet with all my command lines, so I just copy them and I, and I paste them here into this uh, command prompt because I don't want you to see all my typos and stuff. So, you know, still, in reality... That's not very automatic still. I'm going to have to do an awful lot of typing. So how can we help to mitigate that? Well, this is where the power of a spreadsheet can really come in handy. I'm going to make available up for you on NuggetLab.com a document called Create and Modify Users.xls. This spreadsheet can be used to populate uh, all of the things that you need in DS Add to create a whole bunch of user accounts at once. And this is not something you have to know for the exam, by the way. This is just something that I've cobbled together and make a, made available for you just because I'm that nice of a guy, folks. Uh, if you want some more explanation about this, I won't go into a lot of detail, especially since it's not exam specific. But I've gotten comments in all of this that will give you details about all of these different things. So it gives you details about every one of the columns so you can get an idea for what it is. But the strength of this is this. What we'll do here is, actually I typed in some stuff I didn't mean to type in, so let me clear that out. But the strength of this is, this is where you enter in the user account. I'm just going to put in, you know, user here. And this is going to be the name of the user. I put Bisbee user 01, but you could put in the name of whatever user you want here. And then the power of it comes in the spreadsheet capability of the concatenate command. You see, in this formula, I do an equals concatenate, and this means to combine multiple things together. Normally, you'll string several lines of text together. It's going to string together DS add user CN equals, and then what do I want it to equal? Well, I want it to equal whatever's in cell A2. You can see that right here. And then I'll continue on with OU equals Bisbee, NuggetLab.com and so forth. So you see there that because the concatenate command, instead of having A2 right here, it fills in the value of A2. And now I have a complete DS add statement. Here's my user principal name, you know, which I can also have. Um, then I have uh, the display name. I'm going to expand that out so you can see it better. The display name is BizBeeUser01. The password, if I want to enter that in here, I'm just going to use a, you know, a, a password like that. Must change password, yes. This means that these accounts that I'm about to create, maybe you know, I have a whole department of new users that you know, wouldn't be that secure, but maybe they all know what their initial password is, but they all have to change it at the first time they log on. That's a good security practice that way. And then I can specify also the home directory, the home drive, and the profile. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of detail on this because it's broken. <laughs> okay? What's going to happen here is when you go to a user account, let me just find a user account to work with here real quick. Uh, how about this Jessica Sanders account I created earlier? Notice that there's a profile path here, and you can specify the profile path, and normally the way we would do that is we would enter in, you know, whack whack, DC Nugget 1, or whatever the name of the server was, the name of the share, I'll just call this, you know, profiles, for example, and then percent username percent. And then once I click apply here, for example, we'll see that the percent username percent variable automatically fills in the user account name right there. The same thing would happen with a home folder. So I could do whack whack DC nugget one, you know, pr uh, home, uh, maybe I have a home directory. And then what's the name of the user? Oh, yeah, that's right. I'll get to use the, per the variable percent user name percent. And then if I again click apply, we'll see that uh, it doesn't do anything for me. <laughs> Why is that? Uh, DC nugget one. Uh, percent username percent. Oh, it helps if I don't try to use a local path. <laughs> when you use the local path, it's going to look for something like C colon backslash home or something like that. That's not what I wanted. I meant to connect this to the H drive. And then I'll paste in that value here. So now when I click apply, then it would enter in again that variable, the percent username percent variable would automatically fill in that user item. Now, back to our spreadsheet. You look at this and you say, oh, I see the problem, James. You've got dollar sign username dollar sign. Well, let's take a look at this. Uh, DS add, and then uh, user forward slash question mark, and we'll see here that what that's going to show me is that I can indeed use those variables, you know, like dollar sign username dollar sign. That's the value that Microsoft says you should use for this tool. The reality is, if you use that, it will literally populate the user account with just dollar sign username dollar sign. It will not automatically fill in the user's name. Same thing here, it won't do it for you here either. Uh, so this is broken. Now this has been broken for a long time. I first identified this five years ago, and I was hoping that Microsoft would have fixed it, but they didn't. So this is still uh, a bit of an issue. You might think to yourself, well, James, maybe we could just go in here and put in percent username percent like we always do. Guess what that will do? That will take the account, let me just go back to this one, and instead of filling in the name of the user right here, it'll fill in the name of the user that's running the command, which in this case 
is the trainer account. So Jessica Sanders and all the other users that I work with would now have their profile and their home directory pointed to my trainer account location. That's no good either. So this is still broken, and that's why I don't really use it. Uh, but I did list it here anyway, just you know for good measure. Then we can specify that what groups they're a member of. Maybe I want them to be a member of the Bisbee Users Security Group. Okay, so these are some different things. I can again add a bunch of different columns on here if I want to, but this is a pretty good start. Now let me show you the power of how we can get this to work. What I'm going to do is use the autofill function. I'm just going to click and drag across here until I get to the end. And now notice that when I use my mouse pointer to point over this little small black square at the bottom of the cell, it turns to a black cross. Then I click and drag down, and that's going to create however many user accounts that I specify. Let's go, you know, 50 accounts. Okay. Now notice here that it is now automatically filled in the values for all of those, and now I've created 50 accounts. Now, how can I leverage this? Because you see, these are all different cells. How do I combine all those together? Again, I'm going to use the concatenate command, and I've already done that down here, uh, where I've gone to this line, and notice that it concatenates the value of B2 plus C2 plus D2 plus E2 plus F2 plus J2, and once again, it's left out uh, it's left out the uh, the cells that were referred to a profiles directory and a home directory. And then what I did here, I've already done it in advance, but what I did again was I just auto-filled with my little black cross to go all the way down to the end, and that's pretty much it. Now what I need to do is if I want to use this in something like a script, is I'll click and drag, and I'll just select all of these, and I'll right-click and choose Copy or Control-C if I want to. Uh, and then what I'll do uh, is paste those into a batch file. So I'm going to go to maybe an add Bisbee users .bat file. And I'll simply right click here to choose edit. And then I'm going to paste in all of these values that we had. Okay? Uh, I'm going to go turn off the word wrap so that you can see that these all appear actually on a single line. And I also usually go to the bottom. And again, I'll put in a pause to see that if there's any error messages that pop up, I'll be able to see them. Next thing I'll do is I'll just go ahead and exit this and save the document. Okay, and that's pretty much it. The only other thing I need to do now is to actually run this file. Now, I need to be an administrator to be able to run this. This is another difference between this uh, Windows Server 2008 and 2003 is that I used to be able to just double-click on this. Now, I have to right-click and choose Run as Administrator and Continue. And now we can see that it is successfully creating all of these accounts. I'll just give this a little bit of time to finish, and then we'll go and look at them. So we get to the end here. We see, you know, at the last one, again, these are all DS ads succeeded. So that's looking pretty good. I press any key to continue. Go to my server. Go to my Bisbee OU, and I don't see anything until I refresh the screen. And voila, there they all are, okay? So if I just select any account, let's just go to Bisbee User 08, we see that they are indeed a member of the Bisbee Users Security Group that I specified in the actual file. Okay, because remember, in the spreadsheet, it required that. And if I go back to my bizbusers.bat file, which I created, uh, it specifies that group membership as well. We should also see a user principal name in there, a display name of bizbuser01. It's got a password word of nu66et$. sign. The user would have to change the password at the first logon, and they're a member of the security group that I specified to you earlier. So that's all looking pretty good right now. And now finally we can see how we can use one of these newfangled commands to automatically and uh, create a whole bunch of user accounts very, very quickly. Now here's some other commands that may or may not be on the exam. I don't think there's going to be a big emphasis here, but they're useful to know about nevertheless. Here's dsmod, and then we'll also talk, take a look at dsquery, which normally is very often used with dsget, so that's why I kind of lump them together on the same line. But starting with dsmod, if I go back to my accounts, let's say my Bisbee user 01 account is a member of Bisbee users. Let's say I have a summer intern that accidentally removed that membership, and now the user complains that they can't seem to access any of their shares or any of their file resources or anything like that. So what I could do is that from a command line, I could run dsmod group. I'm going to modify the group, in other words, of the Bisbee users. And there's the distinguished name. And I'm going to do a, a hyphen or a dash add member. And it kind of wraps around there, but it's addmbr. And then I'm going to add the membership of Bisbee user 01 to that security group. So we'll press enter. And then we'll go back to that user account. And we'll see that now, indeed, they're now a member of Bisbee users again. And so, of course, we see that dsmod modifies accounts. Now, we can also use dsquery and dsget. Very often, they're used together. dsquery would look for a specific criteria uh, against my Active Directory objects. Once it finds the results, it can run them against dsget. 
Let's just go ahead and demonstrate how that might look. For example, here I've got several user accounts, and if I look at the organization, I see some that are a member of the HR department, some that are a member of, what is that, operations department, and some that are a member of uh, research. Okay, so I've got several different departments that different people want to work for or work with. So maybe I want to identify those specific users and which departments they're in. So what I would do is I would run DS query. I'm looking for user accounts. I'm starting with the domain root. I can also specify a given OU, but I'm just going to go, you know, start from the top, and this would include then all OUs underneath there. And then I'm going to look for the name, anything that starts with bisby user, and then the wildcard character here would be any number there or any other character. And then I can use the pipe command, which is the shift key above the backslash, and then DS get user, and then I want to look for the SAM ID that kind of wraps around, but that's one word, dash SAM ID, dash department. And let's go ahead and run this and see how it looks. And you can see here that anybody, the, the SAM ID for everybody appears, but then it also shows the department. I didn't put any department for these other people. That's why I don't see them. And then that's what it shows me. Now, the other thing I could do here, by the way, just as a quick tip, is I could also pipe that out to, you know, C colon backslash scripts, backslash, and then I could do, you know, um, departments, D-E-P-T dot T-X-T, for example. And then what I could do is um, notepad, C colon backslash scripts, department.txt and now it puts that into a handy little notepad for me and then you can do you know all kinds of other things with this if you want to um, you know export this or further manipulate this data certainly that is a possibility so those are some of the other commands we have there ds query and ds get let's also take a look here at something called ds move now to demonstrate DS move, I've gone ahead and offline here, created another OU structure for Arizona with a couple of Arizona cities in it, Phoenix and Tucson here. And then wouldn't it make sense to put the Bisbee town in Arizona as well, because after all it is an Arizona town. Now that would actually have greater impact later on when we talk more about uh, organizational units and how they are affected by group policy object. We'll talk about that in a future nugget. But in the meantime, that's where I want this to go. Now, of course, the easy thing to do would be to click and drag. I can drag them right up into Arizona and then drop them in there, and then that would be that. But if I wanted to script this somehow, maybe I had a wide-scale uh, directory, directory reorganization that we wanted to perform, then I could do that from a command line here as well. And I would use a dsmove command, dsmove, OU Bisbee, and then just enter in the distinguished name. And then I want to put it into a new parent, which would be the Arizona OU, and I just press enter, and when I go back here, of course, it looks the same, but remember, we have to refresh the screen, and now when I expand out Arizona, I indeed see that there's Bisbee. Now, one thing you should notice here is that Bisbee initially was capitalized when it was underneath the nuggetlab.com. Now it's not, and the reason why is that I have specifically identified a lowercase Bisbee here. Sometimes case matters, sometimes it doesn't. You're just going to have to, to uh, know or learn when it does. It's not going to hurt anything. It's just, it's not capitalized. That's all. Then in addition to using DS move to actually move objects, you can also use it to rename objects. Notice that I'm using it here to point to the Bisbee users security group. And what I want to do is to give them a new name of Bisbee people. Remember, it is case sensitive in the, in the destination or the new name. So I'm going to press enter here. And now we'll see that it's successfully renamed that security group. So if I scroll down here, it did say Bisbee users. But once again, if I refresh the screen, then we'll see now that it is Bisbee people somewhere. There it is, or up the top, Bisbee people as the security group. And of course, that won't affect the group membership. Anybody that was a member continues to be a member as they were. And then let's say that also now we've decided that the Bisbee division is not producing at all. So we want to use the DSRM command to remove that particular subtree. So I'm going to do it with no prompt that. Otherwise, it would give me a yes, no. You sure you want to delete this? Um, I could leave that in there, but I'll just put in no prompt to avoid that. I'm going to delete a subtree of the Bisbee OU. And by the way, subtree also indicates anything that's inside of Bisbee, which would include all of these user accounts and, this, and that security group. So then it's going to point to the distinguished name. And now when I press Enter, it should just go ahead and delete that entire OU and all of its contents, which I can see that if I refresh the screen, indeed, Bisbee and all of its contents is now gone. So that's how we can work with DS Move and DS Remove as well. I'll tell you what I'm going to do: the PowerShell and VB script. It's going to take this video and make it quite long. So I think I'm going to save that for the next video. Okay. So the next nugget, we'll take a look at PowerShell VB script and some other things about accounts. 
In this nugget, we talked about account automation. We talked about user templates. Remember, that's where you can create a template account that already has some pre-configured things that you'll commonly use for additional user accounts that you might want to create. That way, you don't have to recreate the wheel. We also talked here about LDIF DE, which is where you can use uh, plain text files if you want to automatically create a number of accounts, but it's really going to be at its most powerful if you've also leveraged Excel or Access or some kind of a database to be able to cobble the data together. Uh, that probably hasn't caught on quite as much as Microsoft thought it would. Then there's also CSVDE, which you can use to work with CSV files to automatically import accounts or export accounts as well. Both of these, remember, import and export. And remember, I also have a PDF file for easy reference for you on those. There's also DSAD. This is one of the more common tools that I think a lot of administrators, including myself, use. And this is what we can use to automatically create a number of accounts, especially if you also take advantage of the concatenate command in Excel. So that's a pretty cool uh, way of working with that. Once you've got some accounts, you can modify those accounts with DS Mod. Uh, you can use DS Query to query against accounts, and then once those qu accounts have been found, you can pipe it to DS Get, and then uh, look at the results. So you can also pipe those out to a, a text file, remember. You can also use DS Move to move accounts, or DSRM to remove accounts. Remember, as I mentioned just a moment ago, that PowerShell and VB Script are kind of their own animal. Microsoft is really moving towards PowerShell specifically for the future of administration. And although we don't need to memorize or talk about a lot of detail with these, I do want to save those for our next video. So we'll see those in the next nugget. Well, I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.